screen. Good morning. Thanks for being with us this morning, early morning uh, session. Um, we were discussing before the session. Uh, my name is Arvind Gupta. I have with me the former president of Estonia, um, His Excellency Tomas Ilves. And um, he was kind enough to let me go first because he joked that uh, there are 1,000 Indians for every Estonian. So uh, by sheer power of democracy, I'm, I'm standing in front of you uh, as the first one to go. I'm going to present a little bit about what is called, what I call the work in progress of India's digital story. What I call work in progress is very, very, sh in a short period of time, we're trying to achieve a lot. And when the first industrial revolution happened, first and second both, India was not a free country. Uh, we were not a free nation. The third industrial revolution, India was not a free economy. We skipped all three of those. And now when we are at the time of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, India decided that digital and embracing the fourth industrial revolution is the only way to take this nation forward and to bring it to leapfrog into the fourth industrial nation with the help of digitization, digital infrastructure, was a vision set forth exactly five years ago uh, by the current government in India. Um, India, by the way, is going through the biggest elections in the world. 900 million people will vote um, as we are speaking. Tomorrow is the second phase. So it's, it's a big festival of democracy. India is about numbers, about volume. But uh, what, what is India's current status? And I have a few slides to show you. We have in a population of adult population and, uh, and total population about 1.3 billion people, we have 1.23 billion mobile connections in India. A lot of people have two mobile connections. We have 1.22 billion Aadhaar enrollments. This is the biggest digital identity project in the world. Uh, this is a biometric digital identity. And when president talks about the Estonian model, which is uh, a different dig uh, kind of a digital identity, but the base is the same. We have 1.22 billion digi uh, digital identities uh, called the Aadhaar project. We have 500 million unique bank accounts, 560 million internet users, some 400 million social media users in India. What did we do? a few years ago to start this journey of digitization, of embracing the fourth industrial revolution. There were two moves and how the government got involved. Number one is building public infrastructure, which is the hard infrastructure for connectivity. Affordable internet access to all. Easier said than done in a country which speaks 22 different official languages, country uh, which is uh, which has literacy rates of 40 to 50%, depending on which geography you're in, and where people were embracing digital literacy before they were embracing um, uh, alphabetic literacy. So what the country decided to do is lay out public infrastructure for digital connectivity, physical connectivity, to every village, every town of India. But parallelly, also build public infrastructure, which is what I explain here, has been become known as India Stack. This is the world's first interoperable stack, having more than a billion users, not owned by a private company. And this is very important. All the other software systems in the world, which have more than a billion users, are owned by a private corporation. This is something that India built on its own at a cost of about $1 a person enrollment both offline and online, and I'll explain to you. It's, the base of this is the identity layer, a paperless layer, a payments layer, a banking layer, a transactions layer, which is B2B transactions, and of course, a consent architecture. That is the infrastructure approach to, um, to digitizing a nation. What was the second thing parallelly we did? It was about empowerment. Empowerment by providing literacy, digital literacy, cyber hygiene to its citizens but also a very interesting what we did is we, we we found that the biggest obstacle to digitization in india was leapfrogging so we leapfrogged from a desktop computer straight away to a mobile computer a mobile phone which is a computer but the cost 
both the OPEX and the CAPEX. And today, after five years of continuous interventions, India has the lowest data cost in the world. Five years ago, what used to cost us $4 a GB a month, today is down to 20 cents a GB a month. And that is, that is happening globally, but in India, the, the shift was very remarkable. A lot of policy interventions. But, and also what it did, what it prompted, was our consumption of data today. From an average 0.2 GB per month, we went up to 9 GB a month. That's as of, I mean, that number just increases every month. Why I'm telling you this is that apart from creating the highways, the infrastructure, both soft infrastructure and hard infrastructure, we created the drivers and the cars to drive on those. The, the mobile phones are the cars, and the drivers were the citizens, empowered to use these highways, drive properly on those highways, with a very low operating cost, the fuel. The fuel is the data consumption, the data cost. And along with that, what we did is we made this open stack, the open innovation, called the Aadhaar platform, which, which is now an open platform available to everybody to use. And every bank in India connects to it. Every telecom company connects to it. The government connects to it. The government delivers all public services, all benefits, using this platform. And you know, a discussion before this, somebody asked me, what is the cost of doing this? The cost of doing this has been about $2 billion for 1.3 billion people. $17 billion of public money has already been saved in the last three years by implementing digitization, benefits from the government coming directly to citizens, targeted delivery of services. So um, I'm going to skip a few things, but what the lessons from India have been, build open public infrastructure owned by non-rent-seeking parties to empower the citizens with literacy, low cost of ownership, low cost of operation. Three, open up the innovation ecosystem for startups to prosper and innovate on top of it. So today, in India, private banks can open a bank account in less than a minute. Nowhere in the world you can do that. Today, a telecom company in India can onboard a customer in less than a dollar what earlier used to cost $30. Today, a senior citizen in India who, who gets pension from the government need not walk into any government office because he or she can just provide biometric identity of proof of life and get his or her pension directly credited in the bank account without even touching any government officer, any government office. That is a transformation that India is undergoing uh, over the last five years. The last bit, and then we, we, I'll, I'll give it to the President to talk about the Estonia story, has been that this has completely changed the data dynamics in India. The digital and data dynamics in India, from, from being a very data poor nation, India has become one of the data superpowers. Uh, as Mr. Mathur, who's here from Niti IO, which is our prominent think tank, was saying, we are a data Saudi Arabia. We are a data billionaire, suddenly. And a billion people doing all transactions digitally uh, produces the amount of data uh, which is now being used for credit, for risk assessment, for health, whatever on consent-based architecture. So that has been uh, the leapfrogging India has done in the last five years. Lessons for many nations has been, uh, which I have always shared, is how open innovation, innovation as a public good, um, and non-rent seeking uh, helps uh, everybody achieve their targets and goals, including the government, and it is self-paying. Uh, in the case of India, as I said, it's paid more than, uh, more than uh, eight times to 10 times over in the last couple of years from a government perspective itself. Uh, with this, I will uh, invite President Elvis to make his statements, his opening comments, and then we'll, we'll continue the discussion. Well, thank you very much. I will, uh, I will talk about what uh, Estonia has done. If you want to read about it, uh, Google the New Yorker, and then on the same line, the Digital Republic, which is, you get a long New Yorker article on everything that we've done, which I think is the best that I've seen. 
But basically, I would say that we, when I, knowing what India has done, looking at what we have done, uh, there are certain commonalities uh, that really have to be addressed and that are not addressed very much in most discussions of what is going on. Um, my country was also quite poor. We had been occupied by the Soviet Union for 50 years. Before that, we were independent. Uh, we emerged very backward. Our neighbor to the north, uh, Finland, was very advanced, and our neighbor to the north, Finland, had uh, we, we had identical GDPs per capita in 1938, the last year you could measure before World War II, and there was an eightfold difference between us when we emerged, when Estonia emerged again as independent. Uh, today in Estonia, it is probably the most digitized country in the world. Uh, there are only three transactions that you cannot, three transactions involving the citizen and the, and the state that you cannot do online. Uh, that is, one is getting married, the second is getting divorced, you have to show up for both of those. Uh, and finally, uh, transfer of property that is selling real estate. This is uh, something that we've, we're concerned about, you have to have, we, we, don't, we do not allow anonymous shell companies to buy property, which is an issue in the United States and in London and a number of other places these days. But in any case, so this is what, if you, you can do everything online for all intents and purposes. Now, how to get there, people often say as well, I mean, how much do you invest in this? Well, actually, it has very little to do with technology or how much technology you have. Technology is like water these days. It costs nothing. Technology, because of Moore's Law, has become so cheap that that is the least important part, the least difficult part of digitization. The hard part is having the political will to get this done. If you have the political will, then you have to move on and have develop a policy. Once you have the policy, you actually need to create the legal infrastructure that will allow you to have digital identities and to have all, all the things that we have. And finally, you have to build up the regulatory system. So uh, a couple of years back, together with Kaushik Basu, who was the chief economist of the World Bank, we did a big World Bank report on digitizing, it's called digital dividends. And one of the conclusions that we came to with this study was that it has nothing to do with technology. It is all political will. Or to put it differently, or as we put in the book, uh, digitization is an analog process. The work that you have to do is not digital. Now, to understand the difference between my country and India on the one hand and and say Silicon Valley, which is where I live. I live now, I was president for 10 years and then was in the, did digitization, have done digitization in my country for 25. Uh, I'm now at Stanford. And where I sit, I have within a 12 mile radius or 14 kilometer radius, I have the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, and who knows how many other very rich, big companies. On the other hand, uh, when I have to do anything with the state of California, it's the 1950s. I mean, you can spend three days standing in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, to register my daughter to go to school there. I had to show up with a piece of paper that, had, that was a photocopy of my electricity bill, and so on, and so on. You, things don't work. Now, that's because in the United States, there's been no political will to actually digitize. Everywhere you get all these wonderful things created by Apple and wonderful things created by all the other companies. Yet, you are in the US, you are living in the 1950s or the 1960s insofar as you have anything to do with the government. It's gotten to the point where, uh, to give you an idea, as we in my country have, everyone has a digital identity. Everyone has a digital ID card with a chip that we use for two fact, with two-factor authentication and to end encryption. We've had it since 2001. Uh, the US Congress, uh, well, 
you need that at least to have some kind of secure communications. The US Congress, at least two years ago, last year as well, uh, that the staff of the US Congress is issued a digital, uh, is issued an identity card. But the identity card does not have a chip on it that would allow secure communication. It has a decal of a chip. It's just taped on. So they look very, very progressive, but the US Congress today, staffers at least, can be hacked just as easily as they have been hacked all along, but at least their ID cards look like they're very sophisticated. Maybe that has a deterrent effect. What we have figured out in Estonia, and uh, took us a while to get there, is basically uh, what is everyone knows these days, I hope, that the fundamental core of digitization is having a strong, secure identity. You might, you, we've all seen the cartoon from the New Yorker from 25 years ago, two dogs sitting there, one dog says to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. That is the fundamental problem. You never know who is who. This is where, in my country, the state stepped in and said, okay, we will guarantee your identity. It's just like a passport, actually, but we give it to you digitally. In fact, you have to have one in my country. You don't have to use it, but you need to have that identity. And then, once you have the identity, you can actually proceed to build an architecture. And what we did was built a, uh, on top of the architecture, uh, was a, an, uh, on top of the identity, we built an architecture, a distributed data exchange layer, which I, we can talk about if there's a question. Basically, it connects everything. And everything can be connected, but you always have to use your identity to prove you are you to get access to it. Uh, so, the system that has been in place since 2001 today has been taken up by 15 countries around the world. Um, in some ways, it's being modified and used at least as a model in India, but it's been uh, adopted all over. Uh, parts of it are being used in Oman, in this part of the world. And, Mm, we adopted a policy of giving the platform away because it's open source, non-proprietary. This is the basis of the infrastructure for what we do. Uh, we devised it. I mean, the government of Estonia owns it, and so we give it away. We don't make any money off it. It has been taken over completely by Finland, uh, Iceland, Moldova, uh, Panama, uh, Mexico, because it has a federal structure, is modifying it. But unless you're going to have a secure architecture and a secure identity, and also extremely important, is that what you do online must have a legal basis. So our identity from 2001 on is you, we have a digital signature law that means that a, something you do online with your identity is legally equivalent to a signature, which is what allows all of the, which is why we can have uh, all our interactions with the state and with our banks and with all of the other companies that are in, in, hooked up to our system on a voluntary basis you can have legal transactions. Now, I could go on and on. I just thought I would leave some time for discussion with you uh, to focus on what interests you. But if you want to figure out, see what it is like, go to the New Yorker article I mentioned. Um, today, uh, we save 2% of GDP a year. This, is, this goes to pay for our membership in NATO. <laughs> um, we are, and we do pay 2% in my country. Uh, and uh, while we were 28 years ago, we were a poor, backward, East European country. Uh, we now have the highest number of unicorns per capita in the world. Israel's number two. But uh, we have a unicorn for every 350,000 people. 
Um, now that's being somewhat misleading because we don't have that many unicorns, but we don't have that many people either. But the point is, Sony invented Skype, for example. Clearly, uh, I mean, one of the worldwide brand that came out from us, uh, and then a number of other fanta uh, fantastic companies. The other probably one that's known around the world these days is TransferWise, which is a uh, which is a banking system using the Halawal. Uh, banking system of, from this part of the world, uh, but it's done digitally. Uh, all of these innovations came out because we, have, we saw early on that digitization was the way to go if we want to sort of get out from being behind uh, due to the long period of Soviet rule. Anyway, I'll stop with that because I think it's much more interesting to have an interactive discussion, but I did want to get the essentials of what we did out there. Thank you. Yeah, we can open it up for some questions, uh, and uh, we have somebody with a, with a mic uh, which will come to you. But I have the first question for the, for the, um, uh, for the former president. Uh, and this is coming from an India experience. We, uh, there's a big debate, and it's a, it's a very valid debate, on uh, privacy, identity, and, um, and its usage. I mean, the interchangeability that today you can identify um, anybody who's getting any scheme because of a digital identity. And it could be, and mostly it's being used positively, but then there is this whole issue about security, data security, and then privacy around it. So uh, given the new world that we live in, which is uh, uh, hyper around debates around privacy, and we've seen what is happening in your own backyard around uh, misuse of uh, data, what's your take on uh, you know, how government should uh, look at this whole debate of privacy and security interchangeably. Well, we designed the system so that, um, first of all, the security level is extremely high uh, because every interaction requires uh, two-factor authentication with end-to-end -end encryption. That's the technological side of it. The, re the regulatory legal side of it is that you clearly define what uh, you have access to all your own data. You legally own your own data. Uh, and then there you have to do, uh, distinguish between data that is public and data that is private. For example, especially as a, as a government official, this came up all the time. Right? What do I own as, as president? So uh, that's public. My health care records are private. Uh, and you have to, this again, when I, talk, when I talk about the analog side of things, that, is that you have to design the system so you, you, based on your own legal system and your own sort of understanding of what your country is about, and we are very much a, a liberal democracy, that there, you can have access to my ownership records, but you can't have access to my healthcare records. Uh, and the way that that is guaranteed is that I can say a newspaper is always checking up what does he own now? I mean, I didn't never change, but anyway, what does he own? Uh, but I always saw who looked at me. So if you're going to look at my records, I get to see your, I get to see you, you are looking at me. Now, but when we talk about privacy, I, I have a separate point to make about this. Um, we are, I mean, privacy has become a real issue, and understandably so. I nonetheless think that the real issue is data integrity and not privacy. And to understand the difference, if you are, privacy is if someone gets to look at my, if someone publishes my blood type. Okay, well, I mean, or someone publishes my bank account. You know, there's not much to look at. Integrity is if someone changes the record of my blood type because that, uh, has, that could have lethal consequences. 
uh, its integrity is if someone changes my bank account, so I have no money, it's unlikely they would give me more. The point is that data integrity is the real issue. And here, we have since 2007 put all of our critical national data on uh, what I prefer to call a distributed ledger, but it's also known as blockchain. It's like the hip term of the, of the century, I think. But in any case, blockchain actually is what gives you data integrity, that your data cannot be changed. And we have been doing this now for 12 years because we realized early on what is that, I mean, the real issue is integrity. Now, when we talk about privacy, uh, and people say, oh, we don't want to do that because, you know, we don't know what people do. Well, I mean, the way you can compare and contrast digital privacy with, that is well done with uh, analog privacy is a few years ago, a, um, the racing car driver, Michal Schumacher, had a terrible accident and uh, he was taken to a hospital and three hours later, uh, Bild Zeitung, the biggest yellow newspaper in Europe, had pictures and, uh, I mean, had all of his medical records and x-rays, all of that were published. That's from a paper world, because you can always go into a file and you can make a photocopy and you can send it off. Um, you can't do that in my country because the only every I mean the only authorized doctors have access and every interaction if someone actually goes and looks at Michael Schumacher's records which are in digital form you know exactly who did it what time from where and that's <laughs> you I mean <laughs> that's the difference we you are far more secure if you do it right if you're going to be Absolutely. doing privacy digitally rather than paper After Hello. he's asking Hello. Okay. Um, so thank you, Mr. President Arvind. Great conversation uh, from two countries of extreme different differences and sizes that have managed to uh, you know, empower digitization. My question is, why aren't more countries doing it? And where does it start? Uh, well, I mean, uh, our system has been copied by about 15 countries, so that's about 8% you know, of the world. I mean, that's not bad. Um, well, it's absence of political will and sometimes maybe even arrogance. Uh, I, I know that, I mean, since the fundamental basis of any secure digital system is a secure identity, the... Uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, basically UK, the United States, Canada, United, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all have some kind of strange uh, antagonism towards, ident towards issuing an identity. I, when I talk to officials and say, yeah, but you give out a passport, well, I mean, no, but we don't want to have an identity. So if you don't have the government or the state actually sort of guaranteeing your identity, who's going to do it? What will hold up in a court of law? I mean, that's like a bare minimum. Now, in Europe, we have gotten to the point where every EU country must issue a digital identity for its citizens if on a voluntary basis. Um, but very few still have it so that everyone has uh, the digital identity. Um, now, there are a number of countries around the world that have done this. Few of them have taken the important step of actually giving a digital identity legal efficacy, which we have in my country and some other, Finland has it, for example. But Germany, Japan in the world, they have, they have gotten to the point where they issue digital identities but they won't, they don't have any legal force. You can't use it to sign contracts. Um, and the other thing is that many countries are willing, are afraid to make it a mandatory identity. Uh, again, unless you get at least 50% usage, you will not get the private sector coming along, you will not get the government 
to come along to develop services because you, you always figure, oh, most people are not going to use it, so we're not going to invest in it. Why bother? So those are some of the impediments. That's why I say it's political will. I you, can add to that is that, uh, you know, India, um, I think what the president says is, is very true. What we've seen is um, uh, uh, a lot of countries trying to embrace and this has resulted, and the first use case generally in governments has been how we can deliver services benefits better to its citizens. And the countries which are having the political will to do that and remove the, uh, the inefficiency in the system, which also means a lot of leakages in the system, and you know who benefits us from the leakages. So if you can remove, in India it was, a, it, was, uh, it was said that if 100 rupees left the government coffers, only 15 reached the end user. Today, we can say it with confidence, if 100 rupees reach, uh, leaves the government coffers, or $100, uh, you know, the $100 reaches the end recipient. Mm -hmm. And to do that requires a lot of political will. Um, and countries have been approaching India consistently on not one, but two things. Not only the digital identity project, which is called Aadhaar in India, but all the payments. So India has done the second thing is to, to really democratize payment systems. We have simplified the payment system at a level that today I can do instant transfer between a bank A and bank B. It's like sending an email uh, between a user A and user B at zero cost. So payments has become the biggest, one of the biggest game changers on top of identity in India. And uh, for both these things, uh, India is working with many countries and there's been a host of countries aided by the World Bank uh, which are pushing uh, many countries towards the India model. So there was a question there, I think. Hi. If you can identify yourself, please. Yes, my name is Angelo Burgazzi. I am the MD of Gen Venezuela. Um, we have the opportunity in Venezuela now to build from scratch. Um, there is a lot of similarities between Estonia coming out of the curtain from the Soviet Union, and Venezuela just raising now in the next few weeks from a communist regime. I'm a software architect, so I understand what you're saying about technology, and I also understand the need of the political will. Um, so I, this is, this is going to be done for sure. 15 countries, then 30, 40, 50. Uh, this is like a nuclear bomb. Uh, in the wrong hands, the totalitarianisms, and this will be even harsher. Uh, so I, I know this is going to happen in my country, and I may be somehow uh, in the position of influence, so that's a lot of responsibility. Um, what do you think about in the future, you know, dystopian future, 20 years. Well, are we going to give all, all this power to Couple political people? Um, or should we just keep the photocopies? I'll answer you quickly. Hello? Yeah. Uh, soon as you can, talk to the IADB. I've been to three quarters of Latin America uh, in the past three years, talking to, verse, to three quarters of the governments of those countries at the request of the IADB, which is the Inter-American Development Bank. They are not in Venezuela right now because of the sort of <clears throat> an authoritarian regime, uh, but they are clearly interested in Venezuela, and uh, so my, my suggestion concretely is go to them, uh, on what to do in your country. In terms of the dystopian future, I mean, this is, um, well, that's always it. Most of what's dystopian today, I see either uh, on the part of uh, big social media companies or in authoritarian regimes. I think we're actually, this is a longer story. I think we're going to end up seeing three different models. One will be the surveillance state, then it'll be the surveillance capitalist model, and then you will have a somewhat slower but still very rights-based system that is now coming out of Europe. And those will be the three kind of, it'll be like East Asia and Eurasia and Oceania, but basically that I think is what is going to happen. Uh, 
I'm from Bahrain, which is similar population size to Estonia. Um, so in the UK, I saw the, the founders of TransferWise had originally been employees of Skype. And, and so you're on a roll. It's um, easier to create more of these companies if you had those companies. What did you do back when it was more difficult? So 20, 25 years ago, what did the government do to create an environment in which Skype was one of the things that came out of it? Well, I think, well, one of the things that I did 30 years ago almost was that uh, two things happened. One of them is actually tied to the Gupta. Uh, one was, well, 50 years ago, actually 50 years ago this year, I learned to program in a one-off one -off school program because of my teacher, math teacher was doing a PhD in math education and we, she taught us basic. And that was something that never left me. Secondly, uh, I was, uh, long after that, I was in the United States thinking about my poor country, how backward it was, and what are we going to do. And then this thing appeared called Mosaic, which turns out Gupta was involved in creating. Uh, and I looked at this, I said, this is a level playing field. Everything else is going to take us 30, 40 years to catch up on the infrastructure and to build all the highways and bridges and, and the, all the things that we had lost out on. And I looked, I saw a mosaic came out, I went and bought it, I don't know what it was, $29.95 or whatever it was, and you, you had to buy your web browser, but I said, oh, this is, we're, we're no worse off than the United States or any other country. Um, and so uh, I pushed through a, system, a program that got kids, to, uh, kids online and in schools. Uh, I was hated by the teachers union and uh, every week in their newspaper they would attack me and call me an idiot. Uh, but fortunately they had convinced the government that this was a good idea. And so by 1997-98 all Estonian schools were online and had computer labs. So that's uh, well, 20 years ago. That was pretty good compared to most countries including the US, uh, including Silicon Valley. Uh, so. Uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, you should do, is, uh, I would say, but what we had. Which, so we had an environment. Uh, and nowadays, when I go around, when I, at the last two years of my term, I would, I would I visit startups, and I finally started saying, well, how'd you get into this? And it's about 80% of the time, you had these 30-year-olds saying, oh, I was in your program 15 years ago. Well, that's where I, I started the program. So yeah, get kids online early, get them, you don't have to teach them much, they will, the, the smart ones will figure out themselves. Um, in the case of Skype, I should add that they were, uh, they invented Skype, the voice over internet protocol that underlies everything these days in terms of communication. They actually avoided getting arrested or going to jail for inventing Kaza, which was a uh, music transfer system. And then after that was okay, then they were, they, uh, they developed Skype. Yeah, if I may just quickly add to that, um, and you know, President has been kind enough. Uh, we shared, we just realized that when I was uh, part of the team that was developing Mosaic, he was one of our first users uh, from the university um, perspective. Uh, I think, uh, you know, India also has pivoted to becoming a startup country in the last five to seven years. It's not, it's, it's been a very rapid progress. It's a, actually at the top, it's a mindset change. And India was a software superhouse, is a software superhouse. We, we probably you know, house 45% uh, of the world's software engineers, either in the US or elsewhere in the world. But we were only doing 2% of internal technology, 98% was being exported. So to pivot and to say, hey, I'm gonna develop something which is so, gonna solve societal problems, I'm gonna do a startup, required a mindset change at the top. And uh, you know, in a very short period of time, that's the leapfrogging the president is talking about. This, with, with the availability of technology today and common foundation, this leapfrogging can happen very fast. It's not going to take 40 years. It's going to take three to four years maximum. The other thing I would say that, I mean, I need to stress at all times is that from the very beginning in my country, <coughs> we had a very strong uh, private sector component. Even from the very beginning, school program, banks supported it. Later on, we had an educational program for older people in rural areas because that was clearly in the interest of banks to not to have uh, three brick and mortar 
bank branches in every little tiny village which we had. And then f today, I mean, basically, our entire identification system is a 50-50 partnership between a consortium of banks and the government. The biggest users are of actually, on a daily basis of the identification system are the banks, because they're constantly transferring money back and forth. So they really want a secure identity system. Whereas as a, from the government point of view, you know, we want people to have secure communications in a digital society. And so it's been operating now since 2001 on a 50-50 basis. They don't make money, they don't lose money. I mean, they, they make it just so it has no profits, really. Um, but that is how, this is what the participation of the banks has given us is that even though you know, every four years we have another election and you know governments change and they have different priorities, but no one is going to change the digital system because the banks are saying, no, 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 we're not going to change that. That's not a problem anymore because Estonia realizes that what, how, what it's like and its uniqueness, but in the early days there was always populist pressure to say, oh, why do we spend money on that? But the participation of the banks is what has kept the system stable politically. Can we combine a few questions in the interest of time and then probably just answer them together? So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you as well for your feedback. Uh, you kind of touched on what I, what I was going to ask is, with the political will being there, how did you guys work with private companies like the banks, the, the IT companies, to kind of make the whole thing work? Any other question? Yeah, there's uh, two more on this, on this side. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I find this topic very interesting. Uh, my question is, usually we've seen that change brings about resistance. So was uh, resistance one of the obstacles or challenges faced, or were there any uh, other obstacles faced when implementing digitalization? One more question. One, one more. Thanks, both of you, for an interesting presentation. Uh, Mr. Hilbers, I may have it pronounced wrong. You live in a very dangerous part of the world, and you've already had some attacks, I believe, against the digital system before. If I worry, it's that the system could be corrupted or people can take advantage of it. It sounds as though you, you think blockchain does provide some measure of protection. But how do you ensure the integrity of the system from bad guys who would like to find a way to corrupt it or take advantage of it? Great question. All right, quickly. Um, from the very beginning, uh, we had the private sector speaking. I mean, this would not have worked without the, the banks and the government working together. But we had already set up a, a pattern of cooperation from even before when we had NGOs, the government, and the banks funding school computerization programs. When we figured out in the late 90s that we really need to do a fundamental um, we start up from the b very big, from the very bottom in creating identities. The banks were along, and the geeks were along, and the government sort of smart people were along. Um, wait, what was your question? Was on what? resistance change management. <sighs> well, explain, explain, explain. I guess I mean try to. You have to tell people all the time what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, and that it is cool, and it's very good to have young people being excited about something the government is doing, which doesn't always happen, but in my country it did. So you had, you had kind of the, um, the hip and trendy people really liked what we were doing, and so it was kind of considered cool. On the security issue, uh, well, we, we were attacked, but it was, no one ever penetrated the system. It was, from, it was a distributed denial of service system. I mean, attacked, uh, and it was the first ever, so all histories of cyber war will always begin with my country, since it was the first time you had a von Clausewitz-like continuation of policy through other means. On security, we have done, as I said, the one crucial thing is putting everything on uh, blockchain. 
That means it can't be changed. The second thing which we did after the Fukushima incident, which we know Japan lost some of its national data, is that we have created a digital embassy appealing to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Immunity and Extraterritoriality. We basically have an Assange server, I would say. No, we have a server in Luxembourg, which, has, uh, which is on real time, online, uh, all data, crucial data in the country are constantly updated, 24-7. Uh, and we did that because, uh, well, we're a small country. Uh, in the past thousand years, we get invaded twice a century on average. The 20th century, we got invaded seven times. Uh, so it was a bad one. But basically, so if we are attacked, we exist virtually. All property records, healthcare records, voting, everything is all there. Uh, in Luxembourg, um, I would recommend that something like that for all small countries. If you're if you're the United States, you're India. I mean, you can put you can have a uh, you can keep all your data somewhere else as well. But if you're a small country and you have say you know you get earthquakes, uh, keep your data somewhere else as well. But do it the way we did it, which is that it is a data embassy. It is completely, it is sovereign Estonian territory in Luxembourg, elsewhere. Can I add to one, uh, one aspect? Because this resistance to change is very high when you do such a big uh, transformation. And it's not only from privacy activists, civil society, uh, uh, but also from, uh, from the government itself, the, from the system itself. Because as I said, Earlier, $100 used to be sent by the government system, and only 15 used to reach the end user. The 85 used to get distributed to people who were not intended to receive them. So those are the people who are harmed by this. Uh, India's biometric, the identity system, is actually not what you know or what you have, but is who you are. And who you are is your biometrics, your two iris scans and your 10 fingerprints. Now, why I say that is very important is because one of the examples I gave was senior citizens going and receiving their pensions. More than 25 million people today receive their pensions sitting from their home. They're receiving, they don't have to walk into a government office to receive their pension. They have become the change agents, right? They go out and say, I benefit from the system. So the benefits when they start accruing to the users, the citizens, when they start receiving the $100 that they were intended to receive without having to pay off somebody else, without having to go to another government office, without having to spend a day of lost wages to, to get what they're entitled to, it changes automatically. I would even make, take it further. When we talk about corruption, the news always goes to one kind of corruption, but there are only actually two kinds. The news goes to that some official some higher up minister has taken money to do something illegal. There's another kind of corruption. It's, it's that you have to pay a low level government official to do what he or she is supposed to do anyway. Uh, in, I was talking about this in Greece, they even have a name for it, it's called speed up cash. So if you get something done, you have to pay someone. You have to do something that's legal. Now, if you digitize a society, you eliminate that problem because the decision of whether or not you are entitled to something, be it a pension, or say you're a, you know, you're, if you're a, a, mo a single mother with three children living in this place, or if you're a pensioner of this age living over there, all of that, those are all reducible to digital decisions. And so it's either yes or no. It's a binary decision. You qualify, you don't qualify. No official in between that you have to pay. Uh, and and that's, there are many countries, in fact, that where governments use l the corruption, of low-level corruption, uh, as a way of funding their civil service. They pay civil servants very little, knowing that they will be taking money for providing the services they're supposed to provide. I mean, that's a state subsidy. Uh, it's a state subsidy on the basis of the citizens paying directly. Um, when you, once you eliminate that, uh, 
it'll also cost the government more because their civil servants won't be making money. But in my country, we are, I mean, all post-communist countries except for mine are bad on corruption. We are less corrupt than the majority of EU countries. Uh, and we're by far, by far the least corrupt uh, country in, uh, of the post-commie countries, but we are less corrupt than France, we're less corrupt than the United States, we're at the same level as the UK. That's pretty good, and when you think about, you know, 30 years ago we were a communist, you know, occupied country, that's amazing. So this is why digitization gives you also a huge boost in the economy, and. Uh, and in the trust in your country. I, I call it the B2C corruption goes away. So I think with that, we have really run short of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you very much, Arvind. Brilliant discussion. I think the rest of the world has a lot of lessons to learn from it. Thank you.